Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Adrian. I'm the Stewardship Programs Manager for Still Moon Arts, and I'm very happy to be presenting founding artistic director, Carmen Rosine, and her beloved collaborator, Willoughby Arevalo, uh, for tonight's Shitting Light Talk, Growing Art on the Watershed. I'm very grateful for everyone for being here tonight, and I'm really excited to, to delve into the process and all the work that these two amazing artists have been doing in the Still Creek watershed for a very long time. And uh, yeah, super, super honored to be hosting um, for you all tonight. Uh, of course, like all the things that Still Moon does, uh, we are on the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. And uh, I would also like to acknowledge the territories on which I was brought up on, which are the, the Kwantlen, the Katsi, and semi Amu nations. Um, yeah, I'm very, very grateful to be able to be able to work and, and live and grow in, in this amazing place with all this um, incredible opportunity. And I only want that for all of the peoples uh, of our nation and, and of course, um, our indigenous allies and all the work that I hope that we're doing at Still Moon is, is working towards being able to bring more people together and and that's what it's all about ultimately, I think so. And bringing awareness to to our connection to the land and and hopefully bringing something sustainable for the future. So thank you so much for, for that. And um, without further ado, I'll pass it on to Carmen and Willoughby. And thank you so much you two for, for sharing your process with us tonight. Thank you, Adrian. Thanks, thanks, Adrian. I'm gonna um, share the screen, and then I'm gonna. Do you guys have it there, as a full size? Do you yep. have it as a full size screen there? Yeah, I can see it there, Carmen. Yeah, so everybody can see that. Great. Okay. Um, so, uh, growing art in the watershed. Um, so we wanted to talk about the projects that we've been doing in the last three years. At least, These three, yeah. this is going on the fourth year. Because yeah, we did them 2018, 2019, and then 21, 22. Um, and so we're gonna go through um, three projects, three or four projects that we've done. Mycelial connections, fruiting bodies that had two pieces to it, and now beaver pondering lodging and where we've got to so far. Um, and you can see we've got, had several different funders for all these projects, which are, which is super fun for us. Um, so here, here's some photos of fruiting bodies and mycelial connections. So the one on the left is our salmon that's sprouting oyster mushrooms. The one in the center is um, mycelial connections with hands full of oyster mushroom spawn. And then, um, Ted, our, our Ted, our friend Ted <laughs> Tweedy, um, who was a squatter who lived in the ravine for many years. And so we did a tribute to him. Um, and he was also stuffed with mushroom spawn, but he um, never fruited oyster mushrooms. He fruited a bunch of other mushrooms. So um, you guys are already in the know about this, but this is just a little bit about Still Moon Arts Society that we do have a a very strong stewardship component that now Adrian runs. So we just have this little square in about having the stream keepers working with the Windermere High School students and then different classes at in Renfrew Ravine. So just wanted to do a shout out to the stream keeping that goes on along with the artwork that we do. Oh, and we're just doing, we're gonna do a couple of slides of each of our work. So, this is some of the work that I've done. Um, I mean, that um, there's the Renfrew Ravine Moon Festival that you guys know I started, but it's now gone on to be a bunch of other people's work. The, the Silk Cathedral is a piece that is part of a project called Strings um, that I did. And, the, and the, that's me carrying a puppet um, that is, is part of the strings that, um, and, a, and a stilt walker in behind. Um, like I gotta move the photo the, the, there. I can see the images now. Um, yeah, the, so I, I did a three-tiered marionette that I did as a performance art piece 
back when my son was uh, a baby. So that's like 31 years ago. Um, so just sort of the different kinds of art that I've done over the years is different kinds of performance art, ephemeral art. And now we've moved into eco art. Oh, so, you gotta click back on the. What do I have to click back on? Oh, here. There we go. Okay, here's um, yeah, there's and then this is the first eco art project I did. Um, Claire is now 24, so that would be 21 years ago. <laughs> um, and that was a oyster mushroom or a mushroom sprouting mush oyster mushroom. So that's mushroom mushroom, and I did it at the Stanley Park, um, train miniature train as part of the summer, uh, train series there. And, um, and that was really fun making a mushroom that sprouted mushroom. And it's, it doesn't sprout oyster mushrooms anymore, but it's still there. It's still there. Yeah. The, the train engineers have been taking care of it all these years, which is kind of fun. <laughs> um, and then some large scale public art that I've done. And this was in 2016. And this is up on Kingsway. You can actually go by on Kingsway. Um, at um, 2699 Kingsway. And it's a tributary of, of Still Creek is buried under the plaza that's across the street from Norquay Park. And so I did a large scale sculpture of salmon spawning um, so that uh, you could imagine that the creek was still there. And, um, and, and I was quite thrilled when we did the opening ceremony because all the kids came and played on the sculpture, which was exactly what I wanted is I wanted kids to be able to ride on the salmon and um, play on the salmon. And at nighttime, there's lights, there's LED lights that are solar powered that turn on and off um, in, in blue colors so that it, it, it looks like an undulating stream at night. Um, and, and it also has, these fish also have cedar prints on the side of them and stories that local seniors told me about growing up in the neighborhood and then um, Toitzen at Seasweiss also gave me names of plants and animals that lived in the area in Squamish, in the Squamish language. So I was able to put those onto the fish as well to add the layers of the history that we've lost. And now all we have are big concrete fish as a me memory of that. If they'd let me, I would have daylighted the stream there as my art project, but they wouldn't let me. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I got to go back to there. Okay, so this is some of my old work from, this is from 2010. I uh, come from a place uh, called Humboldt County on the traditional territories of the Yurok and Wiat peoples. And we do this wild thing there called the Kinetic Sculpture Race or Kinetic Grand Championship. It's now called because now there are multiple Kinetic Sculpture Races in the world this being the first and biggest and most challenging. Uh, and it's a three day, 45 mile race across sand, mud, water and roads on human powered all-terrain vehicles that are also sculptures. And so we are here, we are classical nudes. Um, my collaborator, Katie Texas, who you see beside me on the front, she's the one with the steering wheel. Um, she and I built this uh, 10 foot copy of uh, Michelangelo's David got commissioned for a, for a local theater uh, prop. Um, and we were way underpaid for it because we way, I guess maybe they didn't have much budget and Katie probably underbid. <laughs> In any case, we spent a month on this sculpture for a thousand dollars. And uh, oh my God. as, as a, you know, to make up for that, the the guy who commissioned us who was quite kind let us borrow him for uh a month or so to put him on top of this 10 person um bike truck and uh ride him around the county across sand mud water and roads in uh unitards that made us look naked <laughs> <laughs> then when i moved here um i I met Carmen pretty much right away and started working with her um, through my partnership with Isabel Gihuac, who has been longtime choreographer for the Moonfest and still teacher for the Moonfest. And so um, Carmen 
got me involved in the, the watershed that way. And so this was my first project in the community it was the mural at um, Collingwood Parks Field House um, called, uh, it's got a very long clunky name, Reimagining into Reality Collingwood's Lost Beaver Lake. And so it's kind of a, an imagining of what would be if not. Oops, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> if, uh, if, if the lake hadn't been drained, this was a beaver lake. Yeah, Collingwood yeah. Park near Collingwood Neighborhood House used to be, that used to be part of a beaver. Yeah, beaver -made it lake. used to be kind of smack dab. It was smack dab in the middle of what used to be a beaver lake that stretched uh, about a kilometer long mm -hmm. or so. Mm -hmm. um, on that east west axis. Yeah. So Collingwood neighborhood house also would have been in the lake, Gaston Park, that yeah. whole zone down there. Yeah. I really like the Vancouver specials. And Carmen's house is in there. Some of you will recognize <laughs> it. The blue house there. <laughs> and then um, I did um, a residency in Mexico at Michoacan in um, at the Art and Ecology Center called Guapa Macatoro, and we filled hands with mycelium um, and taught that as a workshop to uh, folks from the village. And that was part of what informed uh, my first eco art piece with Carmen, Mycelial Connections. I also am author of DIY Mushroom Cultivation, this book. And um, I practice uh, appropriate technology for mushroom cultivation, small-scale mushroom cultivation. So those have been applied into our work together as well. So yeah, this is our first project that we did together called Mycelial Connections. And if you can read the sign there, it says a living collaboration between oyster mushrooms and alder from Renfrew Ravine. Um, uh, artist Carmen Rosine, Willoughby Arevalo, and community members. The hands represent, oh, here I'll show you. So here's, maybe you want to oh, explain. Right. Oh, I could read it. Anyway. Yeah. The hands represent two networks of mycelium growing together and connecting. Over time, the mycelium will produce mushrooms, decay the wood, build soil, and cycle nutrients in the ecosystem. So here's kind of our concept sketch before we knew what it would look like. We knew that we wanted to um, harvest uh, mostly invasive, but also some native plants from the ravine and um, culture a wild oyster mushroom from the ravine and then combine them into a living sculpture. Um, so we applied some of these appropriate technologies for mushroom cultivation, um, cloning the local oyster mushroom into liquid media and then growing grain spawn from that, and then using that to inoculate sawdust, which was then used to inoculate logs and fill the gloves. So there's some liquid culture on the left. That's an agar plate on the right. It's basically sugar water in a jar with a special jar lid that allows us to move um, mycelium in liquid form with a needle and syringe. Uh, so we did a bunch of tests to see what plants that live in the ravine would be uh, tasty snacks for this oyster mushroom, which is normally a tree inhabiting mushroom, but we got it to grow successfully on a whole bunch of different um, sticks and vines, basically, from the ravine. They liked some better than others, but they really liked most of them. Yeah, and um, the reason it's in a pot right now is you have to steam the dead, the dead wood to kill the other microbes and the other fungi that are in there to see if and then you introduce your oyster mushroom spawn so that um, it has a chance to outcompete the other things that might have been already sitting in there waiting, waiting to have a sprout in there. Yes, thank you. So here I am um, growing the grain spawn using the liquid culture, which is in that syringe to inoculate rye grain, which then uh, becomes uh, looking like this jar on the right after a couple of weeks all fuzzy with mycelium. And then we mix that in with uh, pasteurized sawdust and we end up something looking like that jar in the middle. So we didn't know what to do, but we knew we had all this alder from this tree that the Parks Board took okay, down. Yeah. So we, 
played around with it. We kind of thought, uh, <laughs> tried to figure out what we could do with it. And we kind of settled on a beehive, beehive like beehive dome kind of beehive thing. log cabin. <laughs> so uh, with community members, we inoculated the logs with the sawdust, drilling holes, filling with the spawn, and then covering with molten beeswax. We got a bunch of surgical gloves, expired latex surgical gloves donated and filled them with uh, the sawdust and grain spawn mixture. And then put it all together somehow on site. And this is just um, just downhill from the Renfrew Community Center by the, by the low bridge, middle kind of the second bridge. And there we are. And once, yeah, once we built the beehive, then we started putting the, the hands full of mycelium around as if they were mycelium hands stretching around mm -hmm. and talking to the bemused neighbors that walked by going, what on earth are you doing? Um, and then, uh, so the, the whole concept, which is pretty obscure to most people, but I thought it was cool, um, is, is based on the life cycle of mushrooms. And so this drawing on the left is by my other dear friend, Carmen, Carmen, Carmen Moon, um, who illustrated uh, some of the images in my book. And so this is showing how the mushroom spores fly out of the mushroom and grow into each, each one that finds a good place to live grows into a thread of mycelium that then has to find a mate before it can fruit. So we've got, we happen to get about half and half brown gloves and white gloves. So we thought, okay, what if these are each a network grown from a single spore that then find each other through pheromone communication and fuse and mate. And then after that mating, then they can produce mushrooms. And they did. Small mushrooms because it was just a small amount of mycelium inside the gloves. But uh, something happened. And uh, the logs were also inoculated. And this was all with the same strain of mycelium. We attached the gloves to the logs with bamboo skewers. We attached the logs together with dowels. And um, so the whole thing theoretically fused together into one uh, organism um, because it was all the same uh, genetic uh, being so if you it's capable of fusing back together with itself when it touches a different part of itself yeah anyways that was fun in hindsight possibly not um not using creepy love rubber gloves the day before halloween oh, yeah. would be a we good installed idea this the, 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 <laughs> the week before the, sad, the saturday before halloween in the morning so we had Bad to time. we had to fish a bunch of these gloves out of the out of the creek because it looks like kids were throwing them at each other. But then they still sprouted anyways when we yeah. attached them back onto the log. <laughs> so that was that was mycelial connections, and then we went on to fruiting bodies concept sketch. Yeah, and so really mycelial connections was kind of basically trying to be research and practice mm -hmm. for what we knew what we really wanted to do, which was figurative work. Yeah, so the idea here was to have a, a seated figure sitting on an alder stump with an alder log kind of going all the way up through the spine to make it um, vandal resistant. And then to have weave uh, an ivy and um, and um, various sticks, sticks hazel. hazel and do red as your dogwood baskets that we would then stuff with mushroom spawn and we'd wrap it in organza gauze dyed with mushrooms. And we thought it would be a good idea to have beeswax as a sealant because other people who've made mushroom sculptures have used sa saran wrap to seal them to keep the moisture in, which we just didn't think was Yeah, we idea. wanted to avoid the plastic. So I <laughs> yeah. thought, how can we hold in moisture? Yeah. So here's, here's another version of the concept sketch. This was by uh, Rebecca, Rebecca Graham, who's pictured on the far right. Um, She's a local weaver mm -hmm. and um, artist who came in to help us help learn us what the heck out. we were going to do. So we had all these sticks and, and red oster dogwood and we were, we're weaving them together with ivy. ivy to make all the different parts of the limbs and the torso. So here's a, here's a knee 
and a thigh and a knee coming together. Um, and there's the front and the back of the body being woven together. On there, you can see us on the left, we've got the torso and the leg parts. But we couldn't assemble this all until we did it on site because it had to be, um, there's a hand, um, because we had to, once we got on site, um, put all this mushroom spawn into the middle of it and stuff it as we built it. So yeah, I don't know if you want to explain yeah. the... Yeah, so you can see um, on the left there. day one of the sawdust that's been moisturized and pasteurized inside the bag, steam cooked after being wetted and bagged. And then, um, and then yeah, about two weeks later, they're all white with mycelium like this. Um, another note that um, came to mind, maybe it's not the most in the flow time to say it, but I just wanted to mention that all of these projects that we've been doing have been in collaboration with the community, um, right. human neighbors, as well as uh, the multi-species community. Oh, and then this is, we because Ted Tweedy had, was the squatter who had lived in the ravine and we'd heard so many stories about him, um, we thought, why don't we make the, why don't we make it the face of Ted Tweedy to be the face of this mushroom sculpture and um, so I sculpted the face based on a, the photo of him on his 105th birthday. <laughs> and he had already had any wrinkle, wrinkles, it was crazy. And so we did, um, we tried doing mushroom paper mache, which only sort, sort of worked. It worked. It worked, but yeah. Ish. Ish. And then um, there's Willoughby trying to weave the basket for the head there yep. um, with uh, Ted. We had so many lists. Oh my God, the list. Of like how much we had to get done each day. And if we were having a big community day on the Saturday, oh, the prep to make then it what possible. do we have to do to line it up from oh, one yeah. to the next, to the next, to the next? And how are we going to get that done? So <laughs> these are some of our lists. Here's us digging the post hole that we needed to have. And then we threaded a, a stump onto it um, in order to make him, him vandal resistant. And then here's the list for the day of, of how we were gonna put the piece together. Yeah, we had to really figure out our order of operations for assembly. Yeah, and we needed to pasteurize the, um, the sawdust before people arrived because we didn't want it to have germs in it. Yeah, a bunch of molds. Molds and com mostly. competition for the oyster mushrooms. So we had that steaming in the morning. And then as everybody arrived, we had them stuffing all the parts with the spawn and building it. Oh yeah, here's 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 the chip. That's Sorry, Adrian, with your headphones on. <laughs> <laughs> this stuff. That, it's okay. I actually stopped. I uh, stopped the sound for some reason, but lucky you. Yeah, well, anyways, that's um, that's the parks board staff saying, oh, you need some wood chips? We can do that for you. Let us bring our big honking machine. We'll chip stuff up for you. So we got parks board helping us on this. And they thought it was the most hilarious thing that we were going to drive it down into the ravine in our little tiny car, because of course they have huge trucks. And then here we are steaming the weavings that we did so that they also would not have any com competitor molds or fungus on them. And then here's the day where we're we're stuffing these all these pieces. So Carmen sewed um, gauze uh, liners to each of these um, basket pieces of Ted. So the spawn when mushrooms spawn fall wouldn't out fall the holes. Out. And then we had all these community members dropping by to help us help us do achieve that. This, this epic goal. Yeah, and then. And you can see the day is getting on. It's sun the sun is, is low setting, and there's still only. A... <laughs> still, he still has no arms. <laughs> and then, um, and then the last, here he is. And then, finally, we got them put together. There, mm. and you can see we painted the beeswax over the surface to keep the moisture in. But it actually kept the moisture out. That was a learning. So curve, yeah. um, it dried out fat. You know, we didn't. It wasn't a perfect seal, which wasn't really our intention anyway. But what it effectively did is it let kept, kept the rain out. Yeah, kept the rain out. So I think that's why 
the oyster mycelium didn't really take and uh, never fruited. Mm -hmm. We learned. And so once that was installed, then we went on to the next image, which was supposed to be a giant spawning salmon. So get it spawning salmon. Yes, yeah, like mushroom spawn. Yeah. And you can see we've got the the uh, one of the mycelial connections sprouting hands doing the sketch for us. And then Willoughby is laying out the shape of the salmon on the, this is all on the field house floor. And here's how we thought we would have to put the, the pieces of willow into the ground, or that was- That willow. was willow. That was willow into the ground to make our form. Here we were looking into if we could use mushrooms to dye different colors, to get the different colors of salmon skin which is something we didn't end up doing. We did do a bunch of mushroom, natural mushroom dyeing, dyeing with mushrooms, but then it turned out to not be useful. Because mm -hmm. we thought it would be so beautiful to put uh, an organza skin, organza and beeswax skin on the outside of the salmon. But we learned from Ted, which we had done sooner, the beeswax idea on the outside was Wasn't gonna a, work. A bad. And then here you can see the, the weaving process. I would even the salmon. And if any of you have ever made a basket before, you'll know uh, that usually we have, you work with what's called an open system. But this is a closed system. All those verticals are tied together at the top already. Yeah. Which made it a lot harder because instead of just laying down the uh, alternating in front of and behind, we had to go in and out through and pulling yeah. all this ivy through. It was a lot more challenging that way. So yes, we filled up the field house quite thoroughly with the salmon. You can see weaving the fins. And then we had to steam the salmon too to pure to take any impurities out of so it. So first we had to wet it. You see the sprinkler there. Yeah, first so we, we had to get it to Carmen's backyard. Yes, yeah, so we put it on the roof of the car, drove it to my backyard, put the sprinkler on it overnight. And then the next day, wrapped it in tarps and blankets and more tarps and then and put burlap it, sacks and put the hose of my steam cleaner in there to steam to it. To steam it for overnight, I think that we do overnight. Yeah. And then, the, like that. and then we also had a steamer going at the site to fill it with the mush, with the chip mulch as well. And then on the site on the big day of, we were, um, we were mixing the freshly steamed wood chips with the mushroom spawn, and then we were weaving it closed uh, together with with everybody. Packing the spawn yeah, in there. Yeah, with the with the ivy, weaving it closed with the ivy, and then um, then everybody had to have silly photo shoots at the end of the day, of course. <laughs> And then we had an opening ceremony where we invited a bunch of people and did a site walk with all of them, and will it be cooked a beautiful mushroom soup feast. We, we, we did. Yeah, there's some uh, two kinds of wild mushrooms in there, uh, shaggy manes, which are in my hands. And then in that little basket are verpas or the early morels and yeah. then nettles also. And then a couple of months later, the salmon started fruiting with giant oyster mushrooms. And so we were totally thrilled. And here you can see the close-ups of the oyster mushrooms. They were really huge. Like, and then that's this is kind of one of those panorama things of so the kind of distorted, but so it's a bit distorted, it's distorted from head to tail. Um, yeah, and there's and then we finally got a sign up eventually. And but Ted in particular suffered some vandalism, people were kind of freaked out by a human figure or, so, or whatever, or whatever, who knows. So I had to mend his face a couple of times. And then finally, someone lopped his head off. So then we. Time and wove him a new head. I wove him a new head. And then some, uh, I started putting flowers on him. And then other days I'd go by and other people had put flowers on him and wreaths in his hair and stuff like that. So. Some wild. So curly, we. Will, a curly hazel. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know who all did that. But then eventually Ted broke down. And they all just started going, turning into soil. I feel like at this point, it's as beautiful as ever, though. Yeah, he's quite interesting. And then at the, there's Ted at the very end. And finally, we raked him out once he looked like that. <laughs> yeah. And then the salmon eventually 
disintegrated too. So not that's not completely. Not though. completely. The, salmon, the, the bottom six or eight inches yeah. is still fairly intact. Yeah. The part that's woven with willow, actually. Yeah, the After willow. we closed the system at the top, we had to weave with ivy because it's more uh, rope like. We could do it in that closed system. But and the lower layout levels was all willow. That's yeah, right. Yeah. So coming to where we are now. And which how is, are we doing on time? Yeah, what's our time like? 7.37. Yeah, you all are good. Or you like, are going at a great pace. So. Lazing through your time. Yeah, we, we're kind of going at a breakneck speed because we didn't want to take the whole time up just talking about the old stuff. So this is this is actually a beautiful photo of sunset. This is Still Creek coming into Burnaby Lake here. And Still Creek enters Burnaby Lake. It's really quite a beautiful marshland. And um, this continuing on our eco art thing. Oh, we decided we were interested in beavers. Well, I, I read this book. Um, <laughs> oh, it's a few ways. Uh, it, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. We, I read this book uh, by Gen Ben Goldfarb, Eager, The Surprising Secret Life of Beavers and Why They Matter. And I just fell in love with it. And I became what he calls a beaver believer. <laughs> Um, because beavers are ecosystem builders and um, and generally awesome animals. And so uh, also I knew from Carmen and from some of the history from the local seniors and indigenous folks that this, this whole watershed used to be super beaver rich and really, uh, really engineered and sculpted by them. So I thought it would be cool to make a beaver lantern for the moon festival. And Ben, Carmen's son Ben, taught a master class for um, people who already had art skills who wanted to uh, learn his particular style of um, wire. wire work to make um, lanterns with and I really enjoyed working with his curvilinear spirally mm -hmm. um, style that he shared with us and his work is amazing um, and so I took that totally that same feel and applied it to a beaver form and there's Clara Carmen's daughter uh, turning on his lights yes she's not playing doctor <laughs> 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 but she is hamming it up for us. Yes. Um, so Bruce McDonald has done a lot of research with the old maps in the area. And he, this is a map that he put together for us based on a hand-drawn map of, from 1877 that showed Slocan Street and Renfrew Street and Nanaimo Street and all the beaver dams that were along the Grandview Highway. And talking to the seniors that I used to work with that um, wrote, raised their families in the Falaise Park area. They said that they would go down the hill uh, often to swim in the ponds down there and that they were grouse on Grandview Highway and there were frogs in springtime and that those beaver made ponds were incredibly beautiful. So this, this map goes from Nanaimo through to Slocan to Renfrew to Lillooet. So it doesn't quite make it to Rupert and Grandview Highway, which is, where we're doing the project, but you can imagine that this just continues all the way down Still Creek into Burnaby Lake. And um, yeah, it's pretty amazing actually. And Beaconsfield Park that he's got marked there, that's right in behind the Italian Cultural Center. And you know, there's evidence of streams and things in there too that led to beaver dams, right? Um, so here's our concept drawing. And we don't, <laughs> Exactly. I think the I think the the title came first, Beaver Pondering Lodging. Well, one thing that I was really inspired by from this book um, that eventually both of us read is the verb. So beaver, sure, we use it as a noun, but um, he can also he also proposes using it as a verb because beavers beaver the landscape. And so we thought we were just playing with words, beaver beavering, beaver ponding, beaver pondering, lodging, beaver lodge. And around here, there's big issues with habitat loss. 
for animals, including humans. And so there's a lot of folks who are living unhoused or in RVs or in tents um, in, in the Still Creek corridor. And so we wanted to acknowledge them as neighbors and try to improve the habitat for everyone. And ideally, we would love to bring beavers back up the watershed by um, you know, transforming this little piece of creek bank from mostly Himalayan blackberries and invasive reed canary grass and a bit of native spirea and um, a lot of garbage to being a more diverse um, plant community that could potentially eventually support the re, uh, return of beavers to this zone. And um, yeah, and the idea was that we really enjoy weaving with willow and that we learned that it's possible to weave with willow and have it live and make living willow sculptures. So wouldn't it be great to have a living willow beaver and a living willow RV to live in the neighborhood and that would, and it would improve habitat as well. So here's all the cute little beavers, plus a 3D model that we saw one, one pose of a beaver that's really helpful for us to sort of see how we could put a beaver together because we have the same pose in four different angles that we're working five with five angles. angles. Including a top two. Yeah, but aren't they just the cutest little things? And then, um, and here's... So one of our starting points was actually having a conversation with Ben we actually have a, a friend in common, go figure, um, of somebody I know through the mycology community, who's also an author who wrote the book In Search of Mycotopia, um, which is kind of about the community of um, mycologists doing mm -hmm. cutting edge stuff. And um, I was honored to be featured as one of the many, many people in the community in that book. And, um, he and Ben are friends and um, they, yeah, this book was a big inspiration for, um, for Doug to write that book. And so Doug connected us and we had a really great conversation with Ben and he was excited about our project and connected us with uh, other experts mm -hmm. who we've mostly yet to reach out to, but um, kind of gave us a, a lot of, confidence moving forward with this concept and mm -hmm. and um and then here's some um, this is the other element about the rvs about we won't go and we actually attended the um the the rv defend the slocan rv city and social housing now because there are so many rv dwellers it's a little less now that the border has opened but during covid you, there it was just completely filled with people living in their cars because they couldn't escape to warmer climates in the winter and you know and and that that means these guys don't have places to live it means the creek gets more damaged because they don't have proper places to store their garbage or do their business and stuff like that so it really feels like you can't have eco justice if you don't have social justice That's right and so we really need to think about ways that we, if we're talking about that we're talking about all these levels and on the other side yeah. you can't have social justice if you don't have eco justice yeah. either they yeah. are kind of big picture same issue yeah and so um here's our here's our um concept draw the one of the rvs that we are using as an inspiration it's such a cute little one so we thought we, we're going to do the beaver way larger than life size, um, but we should do the RV maybe a little bit smaller than life size. <laughs> so we're going to, I think we're doing like seven eighths size yeah. or something like that. Most of them are eight feet wide. Ours will be seven feet wide and yeah. uh, scaled down proportionally. And so, and then here's our little prototype weaving about how we might have, a, you know, a driver's seat and, and um, benches in the back yeah. and, a, and a sink Kitchen and a stove. Out. And then... And it's ridiculous. And then the bottom left, you see some shovels standing up in the lawn there. Well, that's right on the corner of Grandview Highway and Rupert. And that's kind of the outline of where the RV will be when we get to that phase of the project. You can see the SkyTrain station and SkyTrain tracks in the background, Rupert SkyTrain. Yeah. 
um, oh, and so we did a couple of beaver, beaver look, beaver watching ex expeditions and looking for beavers and having people sketch beavers as a fun, fun activity. This one we invited a bunch of people to, and the beavers didn't show up. So we'll be obliged with the beaver puppet instead, as we waited for the beavers to show up at twilight, because they'd been there a couple of months before, but they didn't come that day. And this is, this is on the edge of Burnaby Lake. We're at really Still Creek. Actually. Yeah, where Still Creek is draining into Burnaby Lake. Look at how cute. Waking up in the evening and grooming. So this was May of last year. So I would recommend going to Burnaby Lake in May at twilight, because they come out at twilight. And here you see grooming away and grooming away. It's just, I couldn't believe how cute he was. Sorry, my iPhone isn't the best quality. And the part of the reason they do this is because they need to keep their fur waterproof. So they have, um, castorium gland near their anus that uh, castorium is an oil-based pheromone laced body fluid that is um, also used in perfumery by the way <laughs> but uh, it helps them waterproof their fur and here comes another one yeah there were four or five beavers that night at I least just, yeah but we just, I just got the footage of these two together, which I thought was pretty cute. <laughs> so this evening we we're there just with our own families as well as our friend Jolene Andrew and her family. Yeah. And there's Jolene and her uncle Eric. Right? Eric, yeah. And Eric, and Jolene's been doing a um, a project called Can You See Beaver to revisibilize indigenous presence on the land and the presence of beavers on the land. So this is a pole that she carved with the support of her uncle Eric there. And it has many animals, but you can see right in front of them, you can see the beaver tail because the beaver is the, the base of the pole because it's the habitat builder for all the other animals in the environment. So we've been partnering with Jolene, like having her come and give shedding light talks and going to see her carving and then she's going to come and help us with weaving in the next few weeks as we weave. She's together. an amazing artist oh. from Gitsan and Batsuatan nations and Carmen's got one of her yeah, prints she, she, on the wall see? right no, there. That's an original painting. Oh that's a painting. <laughs> that's so right. anyways Jolene's a great artist so and if you ever community get community builder as well. Community builder. Um, so if you ever get a chance to see her work or hear her speak, she's great. That piece is at the Mount Pleasant Neighborhood House. Yeah, so this was the opening blessing of this pool and then it was moved to Mount Pleasant Neighborhood House. Um, and then another person we learned from was Oliver Kellhammer, um, who has done bioremediation in a place that you probably have seen many times and didn't realize it was an art project. Maybe you saw the little, um, telescope um, on the bridge over Grandview Cut on Victoria Drive and wondered why are there, why right. is there a telescope there? Well, this is why. So yeah. Oliver is, he comes from a, an art background, but also from a permaculture background. And he's, he's one of those people who likes to shake shit up and um, cause a bit of trouble through his art, good, good, healthy, <laughs> fun, love, and trouble, and subvert both the art world and um, bring back uh, ecology to the fore. And so he works um, in collaboration with plants a lot mm -hmm. and, and other living beings in ways that are a bit disruptive, but also very constructive. So he's done a lot of the work around East Van um, including establishing Cottonwood Community Garden and means of production, which is uh, materials garden, art materials garden. That, that Sharon Callis runs now, but yep. Oliver Kellhammer started it. And he now lives in um, Massachusetts, teaches yeah. in New York mm -hmm. at um, Parsons, right? Yeah. Something yeah. like that. Um, but he's, he's prolific, amazing, mm -hmm. sweet person. And um, so we reached out to him and he was happy to 
give us some insight to what what might be some good ideas for us in this project as well and this is um yeah this particular project when they were building the the millennium sky train line and they were widening the cut thinking were, about putting a highway through there yeah and but they were going to put a big concrete retaining wall up and he and and there was a lot of local people who were complaining that 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 the cut even though it was built for the railroad road, it was also a really great place for nature. There was it was there was a remnant habitat there, and a lot of nature was there. So he talked them into not doing a concrete retaining wall, but letting him plant willow there that then grew up and create and stabilized the bank, and then was subsumed by alder trees and more things. And then and and then the telescope was the art part of it, which was that you could look out the telescope and see all the birds that were enjoying the trees yeah. and the willows as it grew in. So you, yeah. So he, <laughs> there were, the city had put out a call for public art on the new bridge of the Victoria Drive Bridge because, you know, got to make something pretty, I guess, out of a bad appease, situation. Yeah, and appease all the people that were pissed off <laughs> right. about losing more and nature. And so <laughs> he thought, well, I don't want to like make the bridge look cool. I want to make the land uh, heal. And also, there uh, you can't see it in this picture, really, but that apartment building in the, the, the later picture, you can see it was basically about to fall into the ravine. Um, and so he went out there with his collaborator, whose name I'm forgetting at the moment, sorry. Mm -hmm. um and they took uh willow sticks and a piece of rebar and a hammer and made holes and stuck the willow sticks in and also put up um built and put up on poles a bunch of bird houses with the idea that the willow would root and stabilize this terribly eroding hillside and quickly and that the birdhouses would bring birds, which would bring seeds by pooping. And um, the rest is history. Look what happened in eight years. Yeah. And pretty cool. Yeah. So we so planted we some are, willows of our own. Some willows. That's my daughter Uma <laughs> watering them in. And you can see it's just little willow sticks. And then after like a few weeks, they, they start sprouting. Yeah. Yeah. And our first work on the site was to get some of the garbage out. It's not all of it. Um, and we're, there's probably about that much there again accumulated in the last um, it's been ten, all, months. 10 months or so. Yeah, yeah. So we need to do it again. But um, yep. And so here's some, some of the weavers that we've been learning from Sharon Callis, who means a production garden. Earth hand gleaners. Earth hand gleaners. And so she came and was showing us about working with willow. Teaching us how to talk to the sticks yeah. and listen to them. So, um, and you can see us learning and we're keeping the willow damp under the burlap sacks. And actually on the left hand side in the background, you can see those willow sticks are now knee high um, in behind where my sister Amanda is, is standing doing the weaving. And then, and then we ended up weaving um, like trellises for the garden. And so at the end of our session, we were able to um, stand our matter up because our matter was falling all over the place. And so yeah. special note, look at Sharon's hat there. She's the one with the, that little um, kind of woven cap. We went to teach or to study then with, um, with one of her main teachers and mentors, also a teacher of um, I think most of these other people too, yeah. um, Rebecca Graham, who helped us with fruiting bodies and also teacher of Oliver's, yeah. Alistair Hesseltine. And he he's from England, but he lives on Hornby Island and he does some pretty cool stuff. <laughs> that, that's a pretty good wood pile, don't you yeah. think? <laughs> Somebody knows how to stack firewood. Um, this is this piece called Salix Iterum at uh -huh. Van Dusen Botanical Garden. It's no longer up. It has since rotted and been taken down, but it was probably there for a few years, I would mm. guess. And that's all woven willow. With an uh, internal steel frame, I believe. And then this is also his weaving work. So he comes from a 
a, a traditional craft basketry tradition, mm -hmm. but got into the art world. He started working, he told us he started working uh, in a sweatshop where he'd make $4 a piece to make a, a shopping basket. And when he got good at it, he could do four a day. So he, yeah, he got to start in a sweatshop and became, a, you know, basket internationally and renowned and sculptor and basket maker. And now his baskets sell for in the hundreds. <laughs> and um, he, we went to visit him and spend several days with him on Hornby Island. And um, he was showing us different weaving techniques, particularly for weaving the RV. Yeah, notice he's got the same exact hat as, as Sharon. Sharon, and they both got them in thrift stores. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are envying his tools. And his studio in and general, which studio. is just incredible. But look at all those different kinds of knives and benders and things for, for, the, for working with the willow. Beaters and commanders and yeah. bill hooks. These and amazing then, terms. And then this is so now we got two lots. Okay, so then you're alternating between the other. Yeah, now we're doing a right hand thing, so I should give it a left hand twist. Twisting. And I'm, because I'm going over the other one, which makes the right hand right hand twine, I should give the package a left hand twist. I'm twisting it all up to the left, but I'm weaving it to the right. That gives that rope set. Right. Slewed twining is this technique. If you go the other way, it's, it, it's not so tight. It doesn't really lie together naturally. And this way you add a little bit every time, right? Every, every thing, right. Every stroke, mm -hmm. you're adding a little bit. He's a full body weaver. I'm not sure what, what we'll do when we get to the age, but there'll be something to do. <laughs> Use his hands like hammers. Stuffing it underneath. Just the tag in my underwear. So That's my daughter talking. <laughs> so this is where you're getting into vandal proof because it's it, it would take a lot to apart from fire. Case that apart. That's you know that that weave that I did that big sculpture. Yep, it's all so based on twisted bundles. So we got a choice of which one we're gonna do here. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna just do the full round one. Okay. It's gonna get chopped off. That the lower one is getting chopped. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. I mean, this is it's an op. You could try being clever. Oh. It's not worth it in this situation. <laughs> <laughs> and there, there he is in his willow grove there. Um, and you can see the willow is growing above his head in the background. And here's a tree that he's woven together. And the tree has actually, um, the, the different diagonals have now woven into one thing to make yeah, like a living the, basket. A stem graft. So yeah. when when willows of the same uh, <coughs> you know same clone, if you will, um, are are touching and they're all living, then the the bark can kind of the the, the they will graft together. And so he wove this living willow piece twenty years prior. So that's what it looks like after twenty years. Mm -hmm. And so we realized when we saw that, oh, these pieces, you know, we built fruiting bodies and mycelial connections to look good for a year or two. And we're like, okay, we're looking at more like a decade or two or three. Yeah. On so these. that it ends up, it's turning into that it may, if we do it well, it could be a, a many year long project. 
that could have a, like a two decade lifespan. And requires maintenance for that full lifespan. Yeah. Um, this is one of the problems is what's this called? Is Willow gall midge. And it affects a specific um, type of willow called Salix purpurea or purple willow, um, which is a European species with many cultivars, including some, some of the uh, locally preferred basketry varieties, which all of the willow workers that we've uh, talked to so far have been working with. That's what um, Oliver used to revegetate the, the Grandview cut, though now it's a succession has happened and there's none of it left there. Mm -hmm. It was kind of a, uh, a stopgap kind mm -hmm. of solution. So it wasn't intending to turn it into a long-term willow grove and there's probably none living in there anymore, he thinks, and I probably agree with that. Um, so he's not really in, concerned about it not being a native species because it still offers the ecological functionality as a native mm -hmm. species would and it has um, some nice properties. But this particular species is getting hit hard by these gall midges and they deform and kind of abort the twigs, making them brittle and lumpy and stubby and not good to weave with. So we've been advised by some people not to plant this type. So we've been going up to North Van under the power lines and cutting native willow, which isn't quite as flexible as the stuff that the cultivars, but we feel much more confident about using that as our living uprights. And we do have some of the purpurea that we will use as our horizontals. But and some others. Yeah, but um, this is what we will use the, for the living willow, the native willow that just grows here. And in North Van under the power lines, they coppice the trees every few years. I mean, they're not coppicing the willow for us. They're just trying to keep all the bushes from growing into the power lines. But the effect is that they coppice all these willow plants. Which and means cutting them back down to the stump. Yeah, and then Willow loves that, and it just shoots up these big, long, straight Gorgeous weavers. That are great for weaving with. So uh, thank uh, you, BC Hydro, yeah. um, for doing all that coppicing work for yeah. us. <laughs> um, I read another really inspiring book also along the way called Sprout Lands by William Bryant Logan. Um, and he's an arborist who got into pollarding and coppicing, which mm -hmm. are similar strategies coppicing is cutting all the way to the ground pollarding is leaving a trunk mm -hmm. and cutting off all the branches from the trunk uh, at various intervals whether mm -hmm. annually for basketry materials or every 15 years for ship parts mm -hmm. um, or every five years for firewood or posts or whatever mm -hmm. um, and ancient practices that have been done all over the world and he travels all over the world learning from traditional practitioners of these techniques mm -hmm. in um, North America, Asia, Europe, Africa. I forget if he goes to South America or Australia, but uh, he's on at least four continents in this book. It's pretty amazing. So uh, this photo, we were really honored that Mountain View Cemetery and the artists that work there, Marina Ziarto and Paula Jardine said that they are not using the willow that is growing there this year. And so we could have the harvest, but this willow is very beautiful because it's at the infant cemetery and it grows over those unmarked graves of all the babies that were buried in the cemetery without marked graves that had happened over many decades. So when we use this willow, we need to remember those children we lost. So we bundled them all up into our car on a day when it started snowing and we really had fun driving home <laughs> with that bundle of uh, willow sticking out the back of the car. It's funny, I did have the roof rack on. We could have put it on the roof, but it would have been <laughs> actually a lot on the roof. I don't know. It was more comedic this way at least. We did tie it tight, but I didn't take a picture of that. And then we, now we are storing all the wild willow and the cultivated willow 
at Ramford Community Center and we'll be bringing it out as we need to do the actual weaving. So on the right are the wild willows. Uh, the, the golden bundle just behind Carmen is um, Salix alba or white willow from some park trees in North Van that are coppiced annually or pollarded annually um, that Alistair turned us on to. Um, and then beside that, those long, tall, gray, green ones are the purple willow or purpurea the from Mountain, Mountain View. View. And to the left of that is white willow or Salix alba from Mountain View. Mm -hmm. And we learned recently that it was actually Alistair who planted those there at the cemetery yeah. many years ago. And so this was our, our first session with the community with, with our willow weavers to see, well, can we make the shape of of a beaver with willow just staking it into the ground. So this was just a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago. Goodness gracious, what we've learned since then. Yes. Uh, we, we went about this all wrong. We were looking at my, at my uh, lantern for inspiration and kind of as a guide. And so we were basically just making what I made with wire more or less out of willow, but it's completely unstable <laughs> and kind of pretty, but kind of wonky and we only got half a torso and half a tail uh, with no head, neck, or uh, appendages. But it was fun. It was a good way to get our hands in the willow. So we decided to contact this woman who seems to know how to grow, build with living willow. <laughs> so this is Kim Cresswell's work and Willoughby found her online um, and she has been doing a lot of li living willow animals in the UK for the last 20 or 30, 30. years, 30 years. Um, so we arranged for a Zoom, two Zoom weaving tutorials, if you can imagine it. So um, yeah, and this is her auric. That's been- No, that's the ox. Ox that's um, 20, been growing for 20 years or something like that. That one, that photo was taken when it was, um, I think only, half a year old or yeah, so. Yeah, so it's a, but it's the first flush of the new growth coming yeah. out of the woven animal there. So you can see there, there's some of the sticks are green and some of the sticks are brown. Mm -hmm. so you can see it's a combination of living and non-living willow. Mm -hmm. So she, so then we decided we'd make a beaver prototype in my backyard with the zoom camera and her and us walking her around with the camera to show her what we were doing and her telling us what to do next. So we had to make an internal and an external frame for the beaver, just with vertical living willow, and then um, and then start weaving into place. So here you can see it, um, the beaver sort of coming to shape with an, um, an internal and external frame starting to happen there. Um, and then here's Kim. Uh, and our Zoom class, our Zoom weaving class. And so by the end of our second session, we mostly had a, a beaver there. We hadn't done the tail yet and we hadn't done the hind feet, but we'd sort of done the front feet and we hadn't done any detail work yet, but we feel like we have a sense of how you root the willow into the ground and then cantilever it forward to support, to support the head so that you end up with living willow all the way from the tail all the way to the tip of the nose and the tip of the, of the paws. The pose of beaver that we chose to work with, which partially has to do with the site that we're working in, is more challenging because it's up on two legs yeah. rather than all, down on all fours. Yeah. So it means we can only have living willow coming out of that back section. Right. Fortunately, it's a big back section on a beaver. <laughs> And so, and then we have some community members come over to help us sort of finish off as much of the prototype as we could get done. We actually pulled the prototype up out of the ground because let's face it, Alex does not want, Carmen's husband, Alex, does not really want uh, a willow beaver living right in the middle of the backyard. <laughs> <laughs> and then we had, um, we had a, like a, a site launch, um, uh, on Saturday, this past Saturday, we managed to pick the one pouring rain day to do it. Um, and we, we met down at the site <laughs> at the edge of Superstore in Still Creek. And um, 
we all took willow branches and um, bent them and felt them and then offered them to the stream and let them flow down the water and maybe they'll root somewhere downstream. To maybe prevent. some of them will make it to uh, lake. and find, Places. maybe a beaver will find them and eat them. Yeah. And, and we had a, a dance artist, Carolina, come. So she also gave us some exercises so we'd get our hands working for doing the work there. And that was kind of fun. And Luna the dog was the center of attention there. Um, and, and then we started um, digging holes to put, because one of the things that Kim told us is that um, the beavers, the willow structure will be very strong in the first year with, with the new growth. And but, all the weavers that we put in. Yeah, but as the weavers rot, but uh, and before the new the new living willow takes over, there'll be an awkward stage um, where it could fall apart. So she highly recommended that we put an internal armature. So we collected some some branches from a beech tree that the parks board was tearing down in Fillets Park because a big a giant branch had come down in a windstorm and taken out the neighbor's fence. Didn't, um, so they had, then it was a liability. They had to cut down this absolutely gorgeous so it's, tree. It's, to me, it's just like the same things when people leave their garbage out and uh, a bear comes and eats out of the garbage because um, what used to be a forest is now a neighborhood. And, and, then kill the bear. and then the bear gets killed and thrown in the dump in Squamish. Yeah. That's how it works. So here we are putting together our A-frame. And then um, here's the beaver on the roof because we brought the beaver down to the opening ceremony. And um, here we go. And then we had to take them back home again. <laughs> this is a beaver parading up the street. <laughs> it's pondering lodging all the way up the hill. Do you want to tell me? <laughs> so that was on Saturday. And then today we had another session and Cease came and told us stories about um, Beaver and the Frog Woman. And Skalal was Beaver and yeah. Wahas Slonai. Slonai was Frog Woman and the story of Beaver and Frog Woman and, and the Moon Man. Anyways, it was really fun. Um, and then we actually got the pole, the post going into the A-frame, actually one of them dug right into the site. And then we have a second one ready that we're gonna install tomorrow. That's two thirds ready. And then we'll be probably starting weaving next week. And there's our little beaver. Yeah. Yay. And that's the end. Well, that's the, the, be At the, end, the, of the end of the beginning. The beginning. <laughs> so, yeah, um, we will be working on getting this internal frame finished over the next, I'd say, week or so. Hopefully, mm -hmm. we'll be able to get it done in the next week. And, um, and then uh, with our crash course in uh, round wood joinery, because it's all uh, round, it's all wood. We're not using any screws or anything. And um, just uh, making the pieces fit together, kind of like Lincoln logs, and then drilling holes and uh, pounding in wooden pegs to hold it all together. And so um, after that, we'll then plant our uprights and then start weaving them together into the form of the beaver. So that'll be happening um, over the next few months, couple months. And yeah. Um, and then when the new growth starts to shoot up uh, in the sp in the springtime, we'll then weave that in as it grows. Mm -hmm. And um, if anybody's interested in coming down to get your hands in the work, uh, we're pretty much there Wednesdays and Thursdays yeah. most times. Yeah, we try to do daytime, daytime, partly because the site is kind of small and cramped, so. If we do weekend things, we can't actually handle 15 people, but five or six people each time is kind of perfect because there's always work for five or six people to do and space, but yeah.
Yeah, so we're ready for questions if you have questions for us. Great. Before before we hop into that, Carmen, I'm, I'll just uh, just say thank you on behalf of everyone quickly here just now for your, your wonderful presentation. Um, what a marvel to really see that process um, and how like each of your practices have evolved and kind of culminated into this like into this current piece. And it's just like, yeah, just really inspiring the way that you've been able to draw so many elements together and and share it with everyone. So, yeah, thank you so much. What I'll do now is I'll just end the recording and then we can have our discussion. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And uh, yeah, this will be up in YouTube uh, at some point in the near future, next couple of days. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian.